And then, without further ado, let me introduce to first to our speaker, to God's messenger for this afternoon, this morning. Okay. He is a very familiar to most of us, but for the benefit of those who have come here for the first time. Okay. Uh, he is called by God to pioneer uh, this, this church, CCF Singapore, 16 years ago. And he is a faithful husband uh, to Persh, to Sister Persh, and a loving father towards his three mighty young men. Okay, and he is a diligent student of the scripture and a passionate preacher of the word of God. So without further ado, let's give a, a hand toward to Kuya Matt de la Serna. Kuya Matt. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Let me just set up my notebook here. Um, okay. Just to make sure that I have my slides ready here. Okay, good morning. Good morning. When I first became a Christian many, many years ago, uh, when I was still in university, uh, a lot of friends who became a Christian together with me, a, a lot of friends are, all of us, like, we were all wondering, like, hey, how come some of our friends are, when they became a Christian, they felt that they, their life is not better it's almost like, you know, it's the same or it's sometimes it gets worse. Uh, some, you will hear stories like people who became a Christian, the, the, the family started to, you know, um, disown them. So you will hear stories like that. And not only in the Philippines or not only those people you know, you, we know in other countries, those persecuted countries, we know, you know that their lives are in danger when they declare their belief in Jesus Christ. So a lot of them, I'm sure all of us, we're experiencing this. Some, we know of people who are experiencing the same. And maybe not, not in that extent of being, um, being uh, persecuted or killed or, or their properties, properties are confiscated. But maybe they are being uh, left out in the company when the when the when the boss or company know knew that they are knows that they are Christian. Sometimes there are some you know um, unfairness uh, unfairness that is happening in the in, within the company. And uh, not only that, um, I'm sure many of us like suddenly your friends like they don't want to befriend you anymore. Like, hey, you're so different. We don't want to befriend you. So people are experiencing, we have different experiences when we become, when we become a follower of Jesus Christ. And in the book of Hebrews, that's exactly what they were uh, experiencing that time. Uh, we have learned from the past messages when we started the book of Hebrews that um, they also experienced the same thing. So that's why the author of Hebrews wrote this specifically to them. So just a review, I, I don't know if you can, I hope you can read it. Just a review that the audience you know, for the book of Hebrews is written to the Jewish Christians you know, who were familiar with the Old Testament, who were being tempted to turn away from Christ and revert to Jewish practices because of a lot of persecutions that they're experiencing. They are losing their properties, properties are con confiscated, um, um, they are being um, taken away from the synagogue, etc., etc. So a lot of difficulties that they're experiencing. And for them, uh, I don't know how the extent of that, probably those people in the persecuted areas probably uh, can, can testify and they, they really can experience that. And for them, I think the easiest way is to go back to blend with the majority and to go back to where they are, to where they were, to, to go back to the Judaism. And that's exactly what they're experiencing. 
So uh, the situation there, I, I, as I mentioned here, the Jewish Christians found themselves persecuted by their own countrymen. Some of them wanted to reverse course in order to escape all those sufferings that they are experiencing when they identify themselves with Christ. And the whole theme, we we, we, Pastor Keith actually explained to us that the whole theme of the book of Hebrews is that since we have such a great high priest in Christ, you know, since we have that great high priest in Christ, in Jesus, let us hold fast our confession and press on to maturity. That's the whole theme of the, of the book of the Bible. So I'm sure, uh, as I said, maybe some of us are experiencing difficulties at, and the challenges uh, in our walk in, with Christ and even facing our families, etc. Um, so maybe we are, we are like that. And the book of Hebrews is telling us, don't give up. Don't give up. Continue on. Press on. Hold fast to our confession that He is God, that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. And press on to maturity. So that does, that's, the, the, uh, that's the main theme. Of, on the book of Hebrews. So I just want to review what have we learned so, f so far in the past uh, weeks that we have been studying the book of Hebrews. So we are now in chapter 6, but from 1 to 5, you will see that the speakers here, they actually, in, the, in chapters 1 to 5, they have explained the supremacy of Christ. That Jesus is better than the angels, Jesus is better than the, than the angels because he is God. The angels are just, uh, they, they worship him. So definitely, he is better than the angels. He is better than the angels because God became human. Angels are not. So th because he became human, he can empathize with us. He can understand what we are going through. You know? And th we also discussed that Jesus is better than Moses. And Jesus is better than the Aaronic priesthood. And Jesus is the perfect high priest. We studied that in chapter 5. And along with that, in between, he also, the writer of Hebrews also gave some warnings. Some warnings for, for the believers, the Jewish believers, to do not drift away. You know, like uh, in chapter 2. And also in chapter 3, it mentions there the warning against disobedience. And the last time that we, the two weeks ago, Brother June also explained to, one, to us the warning against Christ, uh, being a carnal Christian. So we have a lot of these warnings, and, and maybe some of us are wondering, hey, so these, are, these warnings are given, so what are the consequences of this? And very beautifully, Brother June and Brother Fred Magbanoa shared with us the past two weeks the possible, the, the possible dis, uh, the consequences of if we don't obey and if we don't heed the warnings. Okay, let me just read to you the last two weeks what we have learned, and I just want to go back here because this is very, very important. That's why I want to go through this. Brother June uh, explained to us in Hebrews 5.11 to, to chapter 6 to 3 the j danger of being a carnal Christian. Okay, what is a carnal Christian? Carnal Christians are, these are the people, like the Jewish believers, they became, they became Christians, they come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, but their life is not reflecting who Jesus is. They are not reflecting Christ-likeness. So they're living a defeated life, defeated, victor, defeated Christian life. They're not victorious. So these are the, the people who have Christ in them, but they are still leading their, their life, they're not allowing the Holy Spirit to, live their, to lead their life. So these are carnal Christians. So there is a danger of continuing living as a carnal Christian. The writer admonishes us to, hey, grow up, for all of us to grow up, to be mature, to press on towards maturity. Later on, we'll explain also, what is that maturity? We cannot just, like, hey, force yourself, let's be mature. Of course, we need to do something in order to grow in maturity. And sometimes, it's, it, and sometimes we have that responsibility, and God also has that responsibility. Okay? And Brother Fred explained that if you are a true follower of Christ, you are, we are secure in, the, in our eternal life. So that's very, very clear that we don't 
uh, when you check yourself, you have really given your life to Jesus. You know you have surrendered your life to Jesus. Rest assured that no matter what happened, you, you are, God is holding you. The Father, the Son is holding you in His hands. And no one can snatch you out of His hands. That's very, very clear. No one can separate us from the love of God. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities will be able to separate us from the love of Christ. So that's, uh, that's actually presented to us by Brother Fred. And very, very clear, we don't lose our salvation. Okay, so the only thing that we need to do is really check, am I really, if I really surrendered my life to Jesus? And if you do, if you, do you did, rest assured, no one can snatch you out of the Father's hand. That's clear. But he also mentioned uh, these verses, 4 to 6 and 7 to 8, and which is very, very controversial in a way, but, but uh, uh, I just want to um, share also what he shared last week. So in verses 4 to 6, it says, it says here, for it is impossible. When you see 4, 4 is like they're ex the author is explaining what's going on. So here in 4 to 6, it's saying that, hey, definitely you cannot lose your salvation. No, it is impossible for you to lose your salvation. So that's what the uh, verses 4 to 6 is saying. But there is also this verses six, 7 to 8, which says, when the ground soaks up the falling rain and bears a good crop for the farmer, it has God's blessing. But if a field bears thorns and thistles, it is useless. The farmer will soon condemn that field and burn it. So here, he is comparing two two lands. One is the healthy land and one is the land that actually uh, raising thorns and thistles. So the, the one with the healthy, the healthy field is actually, these are the growing, these are the, God is using them mightily. But the, the other field which is growing with thorns and thistles, they are useless. These are defeated Christians. So if you are a Christian, you can be a Christian but you are defeated because you remain carnal. Because you remain babies. So this one, you are losing your... So the consequences of, of, of this is actually you're losing your reward in heaven. Uh, do you know that we will also be judged? There will be a judgment for all people, but there will also be a judgment for believers. Now, do you, um, uh, Let me sh just show you this verse. Uh, but before that, this is the interpretation that pa uh, Brother Fred explained. There are four interpretations in that verse. No? And if you look at this interpretation, so somehow you need to, we need to, we need to choose the best uh, interpretation in order to understand the book of Hebrews. Not only the book of Hebrews, but the entire Bible. Okay? And very clear here, uh, I'm sure many of us are probably in number two or number four. Number two is some see this text as hypothetical with the author using an illustration of what would occur in the case of apostasy. But we are clear that there is no, if you are truly in Christ, there is no apostasy. You, no one can snatch you out of his hand. Okay? So that's very clear. So based on this, my personal view is that I believe interpretation four sticks to the whole context of the, of the Hebrews. That Christians, if you keep on living a carnal, Christ, a carnal life, you lose your rewards, that you lose your rewards in heaven, okay? And these are backed up by, you can see this, as I mentioned, in, in, that we will also be judged as believers. In 1 Corinthians 3, 11 to 15, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw. But on the judgment day, fire, this is the judgment among the believers. Fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. And this verse says, the builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. That's what uh, Brother Fred explained. You just like, you know, barely pass. You almost get burned, but 
you, you, you pass, but you lose your reward. We don't want to lose our rewards. As Christians, if we really uh, love the Lord Jesus Christ, we want to have this reward as well because these are the rewards that we will offer to him when we see him face to face. These are crowns that we will be offering to him as a form of worship. And also in 2 Corinthians 5, 9 to 10, Therefore, whether we are at home on earth or away from home and with him, it is our constant ambition to be pleasing to Him. Whether we are at home, whether we are still here, our ambition, according to Paul, is to please the Lord Jesus Christ. For we believers will be called to account and must all appear be before the judgment seat of Christ. And that's what you call in the Greek, a bima seat of Christ. You will hear many people are saying, hey, what's the bima seat of Christ? That's the judgment seat of Christ where all believers will be judged. We will not be judged whether we will go to hell or heaven because we will already go to, he to heaven because we believe in Christ, we have Jesus. But we will be judged according to what we did in the life we have here as a believer. And it says here, so that each one may be repaid for what has been done in the body, whether good or bad, that is, each will be held responsible for his action, purposes, goals, motives, the use or misuse of your time opportunities and abilities even the use of our time are we using it wisely for the lord or are we wasting our time here you know, so these are things that will be judged later on when we see the, uh, when we see christ face to face okay so as i said it's not about judging you whether you'll go to hell or heaven but if you have christ in you you will be judged your work will be judged and the reward will be according to what you did here your life here on earth Okay, so uh, with that background, I we are actually in Hebrews 6, verses 9 to 20. But to understand that, I want to read the whole context. I did not put the verses because, you know, w when the Bible was written, there was actually no, no numbers, no chapters. Or, so it's easier to read it without the numbers, without the chapters, without the verses, so that we can get the whole context of the, of the Bible. So... I, I want to start from where Brother June started in Hebrews 5, 11, 11 until chapter 6, verse, un, un, until the end of chapter 6. So if you, have your, if you cannot read, please open your Bibles. Please read from chapter 5, verse 11, and I will read through until uh, the end of chapter 6. And I w my request is that as we read this, let us read this with understanding. And let us just focus and look really what we can capture from these verses, okay? So Hebrews 5, it says here, There is much more we would like to say about this. What is that this? Christ being the high priest in order of Melchizedek. But it is difficult to explain that topic, especially since you are spiritually dull and don't seem to listen. You have been believers for so long now that you ought to be teaching others instead you need someone to teach you again the basic things about god's word you are like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food for someone who lives on milk is still an infant and doesn't know how to do what is right solid food is for those who are mature who through training obedience practices have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong so let us stop going over the basic teachings about Christ again and again. Let us go on instead and become mature in our understanding. Surely, we don't need to start again with the fundamental importance of repenting from evil deeds and placing our faith in God. You don't need further instruction about baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And so, God willing, we will move forward to further understanding. For it is impossible to bring back to repentance those who were once enlightened, those who have experienced the good things of heaven and shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the power of the age to come, and who then turn away from God. It is impossible to bring such people back to repentance. By rejecting the Son of God, they themselves are nailing him to the cross once again and holding him up to public shame. That's why it's impossible for us to be lost again. 
when the ground soaks up the falling rain and bear and the falling soaks up the falling rain and bears a good crop for the farmer it has god's blessing but if a field bears thorns and thistles it is useless the farmer will soon condemn that field and burn it verses 9 to and onwards and this is what it says dear friends even though we are thinking this way we really don't believe it applies to you we are confident that you are meant for better things things that come with salvation for god is not unjust he will not forget how hard you have worked for him and how you have shown your love to him by caring for other believers as you still do our great desire is that you will keep on loving others as long as life lasts in order to make certain that what you hope for will come true then you will not become spiritually dull and indifferent instead you will follow the example of those who are going to inherit god's promises because of their faith and endurance for example there was god's promise to abraham since there was no one greater to swear by god took an oath in his own name saying i will certainly bless you and i will multiply your descendants beyond number then abraham waited patiently and he received what god had promised now when people take an oath they call on someone greater than themselves to hold them to it and without any question that oath is binding god also bound himself with an oath so that those who receive the promise could be perfectly sure that he would never change his mind so god has given both his promise and his oath these two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for god to lie therefore we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us this hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls it leads us through the curtain into god's inner sanctuary jesus has already gone in there for us he went ahead for us he has become our eternal high priest in the order of melchizedek let us all bow down our heads in prayer heavenly father thank you so much for your word thank you so much lord for a very clear um explanation of your word lord god through through your word itself lord god and thank you for the assurance that you are giving that you are giving us lord us believers of christ lord god father um i pray lord that you open our hearts and our mind as we continue to study this passage lord god that you have uh, given that you have written lord to the first jewish christians but also very very applicable to all of us here today lord god father thank you so much and we pray this in jesus name amen and amen okay so reading the the whole chapter the whole context you already somehow get the whole picture of what the author is saying based on the experiences that they have they are being persecuted they are being harassed their properties are being confiscated and so many of them are going back to becoming to, to judaism to the old religion that they have you know um many 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 i think some of us probably are are experiencing something like that as i, as I said May, we we know of a friend a couple they want to get married but, but they they are they are both christians and their their parents are not so they want a christian wedding so what happened is that uh, the parents they, they do not uh, they do not want them to get married in a christian setting so what they did they either they can just compromise and go and get wedded uh, in the old religion or pray and ask so what they did they waited they asked they waited patiently uh, years gone by and praise god the parents allowed allowed it god knows exactly what we are going through and that's exactly what the the jewish also is experiencing and the writer of hebrews is telling them don't give up don't lose hope 
don't go back to, to the old uh, religion and doing sacrifices again and again and again, but please continue on. But some of them probably are, because of fear, they started doing the same thing. They started to <clears throat> going back to the old rituals that they have. They still believe in Jesus, but they are still doing those rituals that they have. And, and the author is saying, hey, we need to grow up. We need to, we need to mature. You know, because doing that, doing that is actually immaturity. It's like you are babies. It's like um, you, when you are faced with difficulties, you, are, you easily give up and you go back. So babies are like that. They easily give up uh, and they go back to the easier way. But mature one, they hold on to the difficulties. They hold on to that. And the, the, the whole chapter we read that the Bible, the author is saying, don't give up, mature, obey what God is, the, what the word is saying. And when in your obedience and the trials that you are facing, we grow. That's the only way we grow when we face difficulties. That's the only time we grow, become mature when we experience when we experience difficulties in life and we don't give up. We hold on. We hold on and we hold on. And the best example that he gave is Abraham. Abraham waited patiently. I will be sharing with that later on. Okay, so that's the whole context of, of this. And, and the reason you don't give up because we have this hope that God has given at us and this hope is anchored to God, to Jesus Christ. So it's very firm, steadfast, secure. So you don't have, we don't have any reason to give up on, on hope. Okay, so that's exactly the whole thing. So we can all go home now and, and uh, you know. So let's, let's do one by one. Let's discuss what the Bible is saying in detail. So that's the summary. So the title of uh, today's message is A Steadfast Hope, an Anchor for, of the Soul. Or an anchor for the soul for the soul. So it's based on Hebrews 6, 9 to 20. So let me go to first um, Hebrews 6, 9 to 10. It says here, But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. Remember his the author has been so harsh with them, giving them warning after warning, telling them, you're so baby, grow up, be mature. And now the tone has changed. And now the author, the writer is encouraging the believers, the Jewish believers, even including us. He is encouraging us to don't give up, give, give up hope. But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you, he says. Things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and continue to minister. Okay, what is these things that accompany salvation? So the author is saying here, hey, beloved, the, our God remembers what you are doing, the good things that you are doing. That things that accompany salvation, is, these are the good works, the, the good works that they, are, they were doing. So when, when the Jewish believers are, are being, because during that time, as I said, they were being persecuted, so they were, some are being imprisoned. And some of the, some of the strong believers that time, they visit these uh, people in the prison, and they give food, they give what they need, f even though they fear about their own life as well, because if, uh, knowing that they are also believers, they can also get imprisoned. But they don't care. They, they, they wanted to continue doing this. So they were doing good things about, 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 uh, for those who were being persecuted. So the author is saying, God is not unjust. He never forgets all these good things. Your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name, and that you continue doing, God will never forget. Similar to all of us. Maybe some of us are doing the ministry we are doing, uh, we are serving here, and sometimes you feel that, hey, it's routine. Uh, day, Sunday after Sunday, I come here and play, etc., etc. Those things that you are doing are not, uh, it, it's not um, unnoticed by God. God noticed all of those, and He put that in His heart. He remembers those. Even though you, sometimes you sin, 
God remembers the things that you are doing, the beautiful things that you are doing. Helping our brothers and sisters, not just the brothers and sisters, even those who are not Christians, we continue to help them, give them, give them food, give them clothes, anything being nice to people regarding other people is more important than yourselves. So those things, God never forgets those things. That is, that is what the Bible is saying here. So he is encouraging them, continue doing that. Because as you continue to doing that, you grow in your, in your walk. Okay, so this is what the Bible says in, in explaining this. In Ephesians 2.10, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. When we become followers of Jesus, uh, by grace, we have been saved. Remember Ephesians 2, 8 and 9? And he did not stop there. Brother Fred explained this last week. That verse 10 is very important. That we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what? To do good works. He did not save us just for us to be saved and go to heaven. It's not. He saved us because he wants us also to grow in, our, in Christ-likeness. And he wants us to serve him here while we're here on earth by sharing the gospel, doing good things to other people, and, and being salt and light. So good works is not part of being saved. To, to be able to be saved, you don't need good works. Only the, it's only by the grace of God. But once you belong to Christ, you cannot disregard good works. You need to do good works. Okay. But that's not part of your salvation. As I mentioned, it's not part of being saved. You want to be saved, you do good works. It's not that one. That's not what this verse is saying. It's saying, because you're already saved, let's start doing good works. And sometimes we'll ask, in, in Matthew 25, this is also one example. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty? thirsty and give you drink. And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, as I say to you, inasmuch as you did, did it, you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. So whatever you're doing, small or big, God knows that. And he puts that in his heart. He remembers that. So let's continue doing that. So in verses 6, 11 to 12, it says, And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, okay? The end here is very important. Uh, the end here means until you grow in maturity. Remember, they're talking about growing in maturity. Continue doing that, continue serving, continue holding on to that uh, promise, continue, don't give up on, that, on, on the difficulties that you are facing until you experience maturity. That you do not become sluggish or lazy but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Very important term here also is faith and patience. We grow in maturity through faith, faith endurance, some, verse, some version will say. That we endure the hardship, we, because of that we continue to be faithful and we become mature, we grow in our maturity. And very good example here it says here but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promise uh, inherit the promises uh, in james 1 to 3 when about faith and patience my brethren count it all joy when you fall into various trials knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience when you are tested you become you grow no that's how that's how the goal remember to to get Pure gold, it has to go through a process, difficult process of burning uh, the, the gold several times until you get that pure gold. It's the same thing for us. And we need to go through trials, difficulties in order for us, you know, to grow in maturity. I know you know what I'm talking about because you also experience difficulties in life. And once you experience that and you pass that, you know you grew an inch or a, a, a foot or, or more in your faith. I know you, you, you experience that. And also in Romans 5, it says, And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. So in our tribulation, it produces perseverance, and our perseverance develops good character in us. 
and in that, that character, we continue to look, uh, to look up to the, to the hope that God has uh, bestowed upon us. Okay? So it says here, um, the, in verse 12, it says there, imitate those who have been with us, th those who have gone before us. And the, the good example here is Abraham. And, he, and I just want to explain to you what happened to Abraham. Many of you know the story, but I just want to remind you what happened. So Abraham, Abraham his name was Abraham that time. So Abraham, he was 75 years old when God called him to leave his, to leave his country, Haran. So to move to a place where he doesn't know where. And that's what he, God told him. Hey, go to this place that I will tell you to go. And I will give you this land. I will bless you. I will make, your, I will make you, uh, give you descendants. And I will bless you. Whoever will bless you will be blessed. Whoever curses you will be cursed. So those are the promises that God has given him. And he was 75 years old when he went there. And then there, Abraham went ahead. He went and he, he reached the, the land Canaan. You know, Canaan is the promised land, right? He doesn't know that time, what is the, whether that's the promised land. So he went there and when he reached there, he pitched a tent and he set up, a, uh, he set up a, an altar for the, to the Lord. And this is what he's, and God told him, then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring, I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him in Genesis 12, 7. Okay, so after that, so he was there. Uh, so he explored the land. Um, he saw, he went to the Negev, Shechem. He explored the beautiful land of Canaan. And then he was going away and he went to Egypt. And then from Egypt, he went back to he went back to the land of uh, Canaan, and then he so he, he went a tour, um, um, and then when he went back to the place where he set up his altar, God once again reminded him about the promise. In Genesis thirteen fifteen sixteen it says, "For all the lands which you see, I give to you." and your descendants forever. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. If you look at this, he, God, is blessed. God said, I will bless you, we'll give you this land, this piece of land. But I will also give you descendants. Look at here, I will make your descend descendants as the dust of the earth. But the problem is, you all know, right? We all know, Abram has no... Uh, child that time. Uh, he is married to Sarai, Sarai before became Sar she became Sarah. So they are, they are together and God promised them that they will be, uh, the he will be the father of many nations. He will be the man, it says here, your descendants could number, if you could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. In you know the, the sand, no, nobody can, uh, can count the, the, the sand, right? And also in this part, there are also mention about if you can count the stars, then that will be your descendants as well. But the problem is, Abraham is not, uh, he is not, he doesn't have a child, you know? He doesn't have a child. That's the big problem. But he believed, he believed God. So, so because of that belief, he's, um, Every time he's, he went into Sarai, and year after year, he will ask Sarah, Sarah, are you pregnant? Are you, do you, are you experiencing no see now? And every time, Sarah will say, no, no, master, no, Lord, no. And then year after year, I think many of you can, ex can, can um, relate to that. If you have been praying for your child, and year after year, you don't see... But same with Abraham, that's exactly what they're experiencing. Nothing. But the promise is there that he will become a father of many nations. So things pass January, February, March, April. Uh, um, he will always ask, Sarah, is there anything now? The, are you experiencing vomiting, etc., etc.? No, Lord. So nothing. So if you're Abraham, what will you experience? Uh, what will you feel? Some of us will be frustrated. 
And you will see that after 10 years, after 10 years, still nothing. Still nothing. But God continued to rem remind him. He said, then God, this is after 10 years, or 10 years. Then he brought him outside and said, look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. God, I think God saw the heart of Abraham that hey, I, he's being impatient, etc. But he's holding on to that promise. After 10 years, nothing happened. You know the story. He asked, Sarah said, hey, maybe it's not through me. Maybe through Hagar, the, the, the helper or the, uh, the assistant of Sarah. And then, true enough, <laughs> Uh, Abraham became impatient, so he went in with, uh, to, to Hagar, and Hagar bore him, bore him a child, and that, that child was named Ishmael. But God said, so they thought, hey, maybe this is through Ishmael that we will be blessed. But God said to him, no, it's not, it's not through Ishmael, but through the, the son that I will give you through Sarah. So that's the, and he was already like, what? 75 plus 10, and then after a year, Ishmael was born, so he was now 86. 86 years old, and Sarah is now 76. And for all of us, uh, for, for um, I don't know who are already in that 70 or plus, you know that you cannot get, you know, you cannot have a child anymore at that age. So for them, like, they cannot understand. But God told him, no, you will be blessed with a son. And in, in Genesis 17, that's after when Abraham was already 99 years old. So he waited for 24 years. God again reminded him, no longer shall your name be called Abraham, but your name shall be Abraham. Abraham means father of many nations. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings will come forth from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. Because here, this is after 99 years, and Abraham was saying, Master, I don't have a child. How can this happen? I only have the, the what? The, his assistant. No, and he is the, uh, the, his assistant, he said, but he is not my child. And then God assured him, no, I will give you. And that was him, 99 years old. And how old was Sarah? 10 years difference. So 89. So true enough, after waiting for so long, the next year, when Abraham was already 100 years old, he bore a son and he called him Isaac. And that's the time. Uh, so if you're Abraham, what will you feel? You will, be, you will be so, so excited. You'll be so, so, you'll be celebrate. You'll call everyone and celebrate with you and, and really like, hey, this is a promise and you will really praise God and you probably you will be jumping. You know, when we get answered prayer, like getting a new job, getting a, a girlfriend or boyfriend, how, you, how do you feel? You, you shout and you announce to everyone, hey, I'm getting married, hey, you know. Exactly, that's how Abraham felt when he, be when he became a father to Isaac. He's, they celebrated. But there's a twist in the story. The twist is, when, Ab when Isaac grew as a teenager, we don't know what age, God tested Abraham. Then he said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So that's, so Abraham has to offer Isaac. And then we know the story that when he was about to, to punch, the, punch the knife to, to Isaac, the angel of the Lord appeared. Don't lay a hand of the boy. The angel said, do not hurt him in any way. For now I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me even your son, your only son. What made Abraham do that? What made Abraham do that to, to really offer with, with faith? 
No, that actually was born from, from the patience, the endurance, growing in the Lord. He knew God because of that 24 years of waiting, and God has been blessing him, and he was growing in the Lord. Of course, he, was, he failed here and there, but he continued trusting him, trusting God. And that actually, he knew that if God, in Hebrews we know, right? It's, it was written in Hebrews 11, that Abraham knew that if God will get Isaac, and if he dies, he can also bring him to life. We have that hindsight in Hebrews 11, that what's, that's actually what's going on in the mind of Abraham. That he knew, even if I kill Isaac, God is so powerful that he will be able to raise him up again. And that actually is maturity that, that was experienced and, and exemplified by Abraham. And the, the, the Bible is saying in Hebrews 6, he's saying, let us copy how Abraham grew in maturity. That when we experience difficulties, trials, temptation, whatever, let's hold on because God's promise is real. God's promise is real. That's in Genesis 22. And he said here, Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, he, God again, once again, renewed his promise, renewed his covenant to Abraham. And in this, Genesis 22, 15 to 17, it says, Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess. In verse 18, in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Uh, just, a, just a side note, in verse 18, suddenly he switched to, in your seed, singular, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. If you study this, you will know that that seed is being referred to Jesus Christ in the future. So Jesus Christ belongs to the lineage of Abraham, David, um, and, and that's the promise that God has given in your seed all the nations, all of us, not just the Jewish, not, the, not just the Israelites, but all those who will belong to him, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Looking at verse 17, he said, he, God renewed his, commitment, his covenant to, uh, to Abraham. Blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply your descendants. And this is where Hebrews 6, 13, 15, uh, they, they, they met here. For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely, blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. He received the promise after he patiently endured. But look at this. Because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. So it's actually not bad to swear. No, swear, it's not swearing as in, but it's more of like, I swear, I promise, you know? I swear to, to God, something like that. Sometimes we do that. I, I promise I will pay you. But can I borrow some money? I promise I will, I will pay you. you know? I swear to God, I will pay you. I swear to God, I will come back. So some, some people are doing that. God also, he did swear, but he did swear to, to who? If you swear, you need to swear to someone greater than you. But here, obviously, there's no one greater than God. That's why he said, because he, he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. Because no one is greater than God. So he swore by himself that I will do this to you, he said. So obedience, you see here, obedience leads to blessings. So the key thing here is that it, uh, it's not knowing, to, knowing a lot of verses, memori memorizing a lot of verses. It's not just that in order to grow, for us to grow in maturity. But for us to grow in maturity is to obey what we are learning in the Word of God. You cannot bombard yourself with too many verses and then not apply it. Because it will be head knowledge. But what 
the, what this is saying is that obey what you are learning in the Word of God. Okay? Obey what you are learning in, in the Word of God. So when you obey everything that God is commanding us, then we will grow in our Christian walk. In, in, we, obedience leads to blessing. So in 16 to 18, now when people take an oath, they call on someone greater than themselves to hold them to it. And without any question, that is binding. God also bound himself with an oath so that those who received the promise could be perfectly sure that he would never change his mind. So God has given, given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold on to the hope that lies before us. What is he saying here? When God made a covenant to Abraham, he did the promise in words, right? He said, I, I promise I will bless you. I will multiply you so many things. That's a promise. No, that's a promise. But what he did in Genesis 15, uh, chapter uh, verse 15, what he did there also he did an oath. That oath is like a written covenant, a blood covenant. So not just in words he promised, but also he sealed it with, with a covenant, with a blood covenant. Okay? So those both promise and oath are, are very powerful because the promise came from God. He cannot swear to anyone else but to himself because he's, he's God. And then coupled with that promise, he gave that blood covenant, the oath. What is that? In, the, in, the, in their culture, there are three types of covenant. One is, they call it salt covenant. One is shoe covenant. And what is blood covenant? Uh, I won't go through the detail of the salt covenant and shoe covenant, but salt covenant is more of like, you know, when you are two, two men, for example, are walking in the desert, all of them actually are carrying a pouch of salt. And that salt, when I promise you something, I will give you this salt and you give me your salt. So something like that. And salt is a precious commodity that time because the salt are used in so many ways, preserved food. So salt is very, very precious at that time. So there is that salt covenant. There's also shoe covenant. You remember Ruth and Boaz? Boaz gave that his sandal that um, it made a covenant between him and the next kinsman redeemer for that uh, about who will root Mary, and Boaz also gave that shoe covenant as a sign of an oath. Now, both those are temporary because if you don't want, you can just return. The third is the very serious one, blood covenant, because in the blood covenant, you kill the animal, and then you cannot say, I don't want anymore, because if you don't want anymore, you cannot bring back the animal into life again. It's dead. So, so when you do blood covenant, you have to fulfill it. No way that you, but here, what God did is a blood covenant. You see this? There are animals uh, that Abraham killed, and then you separate them together, and then th those two who are doing covenant will pass through that in between those animals as a covenant. But here in Hebrews 6, 13, 15, so for when God made a promise to Abraham because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, and he gave this covenant. So Genesis 15, 17 says, When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. If you look at the picture, that's Abraham. Abraham was sleeping. He is sleeping. While he is sleeping, God, the, being represented by the torch, that fire, that fire alone walked in between the animals. And that represents that only God actually, he made a covenant uh, to himself, to, to, to Abraham, without Abraham walking on the, uh, on, uh, in between. Meaning, it's only God who made that covenant, and Abraham is not, he's not, uh, he cannot do anything to break the covenant because he was, he, there's nothing for him to, to break. But Abraham, if this covenant doesn't happen, everything is blamed to God because only God passed through. So here, very, very important that God made the covenant to Abraham by himself. 
That's how important it is that no one can break that covenant. You know? God is not a liar. He will fulfill. So that's exactly what happened here. So that's why he, Abraham can hold on to that promise because it's, it's held by the Father, held by God. Okay, you look at that. Hebrews 6.18 says, So God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have a great confidence as we hold on to the hope that lies before us. So there, uh, in the, uh, the author introduced the hope that lies before us. That hope, that hope is very, very important for all of us uh, in order for us to live a Christian, a victorious Christian life. People who doesn't have hope, if you don't, if you lose hope, people, sometimes those who are suicidal, they are the ones who lose hope. Once they lose hope, you don't have a meaning, meaning to live a life. That's why it's, being, it's very, very important that we don't lose hope. Hope up against hope. Let's hold on to that hope. And what's the reason we can hold on to this hope? It says in Hebrews 11, 13 to 16, um, remember these people, the heroes of faith. All of them actually, they died without seeing that promise. But even though they didn't see that, they hold on to that hope that they have. They have the heroes of faith, but they're also heroes of hope. You know, they, they, they did, uh, it says here, all these people died still believing what God had promised them. They did not receive what, has, what was promised, but they saw it all from a distance and welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads here on earth. Obviously, people who say such things are looking forward to a country they can call their own home. If they had, l had longed for the country they come from, they, would, they could have gone back. But they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he is he has prepared a city for them. These people, these heroes of faith, there were also heroes of hope. They did not see uh, from their own eyes those promise. You know, but, but they hold on to that promise that soon they will be with the Father. They are looking forward to that hope that they have, that they will be with the Father. And Hebrews 6, 19 to 20 says, This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil, which Jesus has entered as, as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. This is very important. What is this hope? This hope we have as an anchor for the soul. This hope... We need this. We need this hope as an anchor for, this, for our soul. And we can hold on to this hope because this hope are, is both sure and steadfast. Why? Because this hope is anchored. Actually, I have here an anchor so that, you know, the ships, the ships when, they are, when they're on the dock and they're a storm, they need an anchor. Imagine a ship without an anchor and they're facing storms. What do you think will happen to the ship? What do you think will happen to the ship? Probably it will capsize, it will be battered, and it will be, you know, uh, and, and it will be gone. So anchor is very important because the ships know, the captain knows that they will experience storm in some point when they journey. Similarly, the author is saying to us, we need an anchor, anchor for the soul, the, for, for the soul. And that's the hope that he's giving us. That hope, that anchor, I have here a sample of this anchor so that we all remember. I have here a big anchor here. Yeah. So I hope you remember this anchor. All of us, no matter what situation we are in, we need an anchor. Especially we are facing a difficult situation now. Especially because we are facing... Trials, temptations, difficulties, inflation is happening, uh, losing of job, uh, persecution from different people, um, sickness. I, I don't know what, what, what pressure you are facing, what difficulties you are facing. But if you are not anchored to the hope that God has given us, we will not be able to, we will not be able to withstand. We will be battered. We will be tossed back and forth you know, in our journey. 
And this one, this anchor of hope, it says here, it's sure and steadfast. Why is it sure and steadfast? Because that anchor, you look at the picture there, the ship, the anchor is actually in heaven. That anchor actually is held by Jesus Christ. And he entered as a forerunner. He went ahead of us by dying on the cross for all our sins. He brought that, he gave that, that anchor. It's anchored within the veil. Who is within the veil? The Holy of Holies, the Father, the God the Father. That's actually the one holding the anchor. So because God is, um, God is faithful, God is steadfast, God is, God is faithful, He will never go, He will never um, um, allow us to be battered if we, we have that anchor. You know? And that anchor of the soul is anchored to heaven. And we have, I, I want to call a brother here. Uh, he actually, brother, brother Jay actually shared about his life, uh, the, the journey that they ex he experienced and his family. And, and re reading his testimony, I felt uh, so, so encouraged by how God has held them in, 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 his, in God's hand. And Brother Jay, as I, as I said, he shared a bit of that. And I requested that brother, Brother Paolo, to share, to give some details so that you also will be blessed. That even in the midst, can I call Brother Paolo Rada to share? But while he's coming up, even in the midst of difficulties, trials that they, are, they experience, they hold on to that promise. They hold on to that hope that we have. Brother Paolo? It is written in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 9. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. This verse enlightened me when someone shared the gospel to me and asked, when this building suddenly collapsed and you die, will you go to heaven? I answered, I am not sure. It is only the Lord who knows. That was before accepting Christ as my Lord and Savior. God's word became the foundation of my, of my faith, as spoken to us in John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. My mom encouraged her family to attend CCF after being persistently invited by her office mate. My mother urged my father to attend even just for one day, so he did. Then the next Sunday, it was my father who prepared ahead of us, wanting us to arrive early for the CCF St. Francis worship in service in Ortigas. Since then, we regularly worship together as a family. In 2009, a trial came to our family. It was late at night when four armed robbers forced their way inside our house. We were forced to lay down flat on our face while the guns were pointed at our heads and on our backs. They also hugged my father. Then my father said to them that they can get everything but pleaded not to harm anyone in our family. The words of my father deeply touched and crushed my heart. The words of my father deep, deeply touched and crushed my heart. One of the robbers wanted to end our lives. Suddenly, the robbers rushed going down and out of our house. We just waited for a while, and my mom asked, what have you been thinking all the while? We discovered that all of us were praying as we are turned around facing the ground. Then we all prayed together and thanked God for protecting us. We praised God that our lives were spared. Psalm 18 verse 2 says, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my Savior. My God, my rock, in whom I take refuge. My shield and the horn of my salvation. My stronghold. In 2018, I pro pro proposed to Ashley, who is now my lovely wife, 
We got married here in Singapore on February 2020 with the presence of our family and friends. It was by God's grace that we have gone through challenging times as we faced the emerging COVID-19. On July 2020, both my father and my mother were infected with COVID-19. Being infected then seems like groping in the dark room of uncertainty. My, my father was rushed and confined in a hospital. Things happened so fast that it only took around three weeks until my father passed away on August 1, 2020. I was not able to personally see my father, neither talk to him nor even hear his voice during those last moments. It was difficult and devastating to accept what happened. But God slowly has been telling me that he blessed me with generous years of time with my father. The Lord has taught me to be grateful on what he has given to me. And I'm reminded of his message in the book of Job, chapter, of Job chapter 1, verse 21. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. During the time when my father was fighting for his life, I prayed that God would heal him and allow my father to testify the Lord's goodness and faithfulness. I am, I am in awe to be standing here now and be the one to tell the story about God's faithfulness in our family. For it is the Lord's grace that our family is continuing the race set before us. I also consider this as a tribute to my father. Indeed, God's faithfulness is not solely defined on all victories and survivals in life, but much more on how we become victorious over loss and despair. For Christ have already won the battle for us. Our family assured that my father is dwelling now in the house of the Lord. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 14, he says, For this world is not our permanent home. We are looking forward to a home yet to come. This is related to what Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. I am grateful to God that my mother was able to recover from COVID-19. God is telling our family that he knows what we're going through. His grace is never less, and his will is never imperfect. Indeed, God is always faithful. Great part of God's grace and blessings are the people around us, our relatives, friends, brothers and sisters in Christ who have extended their sympathies and condolences in all kinds of ways that went a long way to encourage us and to help us get through our grievances. I am blessed with my discipleship leaders and brothers in the discipleship group as they became a family to me and my wife. Moving, moving on from here, I surrender and trust everything to the Lord with all my heart. I know that God still has many plans for me. He's, yet, he's not yet done with me and with my family. And he said in his word, in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will also help you. I will also uphold you with my righteous right hand. I am Paolo Rada, witness of God's almighty love power. To him be all the glory, honor, majesty, and praise. Praise God. Thank you, Brother Paolo. Stay here. We'll pray for you. And maybe we can call Sister Ashley, uh, the wife of Brother Paolo. Amazing how God has been holding them up. Um, I was thinking, like, if that happens to me, I don't know what I will do. But the, the hope of God that we have, that they have, uh, knowing that we are just nomads here on earth. And what's important is our relationship with the Father. And that's actually uh, held, held them strong in their faith. And I pray, let's, let's pray for our Brother Paolo and Radha and their family. Lord God, we thank you, Lord, for the wonderful um, show of your faithfulness in the life of Brother Paolo, Sister Ashley, and their family, Lord God. Father, we cannot... Uh, fathom lord the difficulty they face lord god but we thank you lord for your for holding them up, them up lord god 
for your faithfulness, Lord God. Lord, we, we thank you, Lord, for how you've uh, blessed them, Lord, with, this, with, with that hope in you, Lord God, knowing that what's important is, Lord God, uh, we continue on to you, Lord God, our relationship to you, Lord God, because at the end of the day, Lord God, we hope, Lord, to, and long to be with you forever, Lord God. Father, thank you, Lord God. We pray that you continue to bless this family. Continue, Lord, we ask that you continue to uh, grant them protection, Lord God, and uh, bless their family and use them mightily, Lord God, continually, Lord, to, to further your kingdom so that the many people will continue to be blessed, Lord God, and continue to help them to be the salt and light, Lord God, in the place where they work, Lord God, and the community they belong to, Lord God. Father, thank you so much, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. God bless. God bless. <laughs> oh, and we, 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 we praise God for, I, I know you are experiencing di diff different difficulties, trials, whatever it may be. We know that we can hold on to God. The important thing is we hold on to his promise that he will never leave us nor forsake us. There are so many promises in the Bible, and the only way we, to know those promises is to read, the, those, to read those verses. And then hold on to it, knowing that, Lord, I know you will never leave me nor forsake, forsake me. No matter what, God knows what's ha happening in your life. God is in control. I don't know what it is you're going through, but God is in control. Maybe you're facing, like, maybe your family is... Uh, the enemy is tearing it down, but God is faithful. He will help you. We just need to be patient. We just need to be praying. We just need to continue to hold on to him. I like what uh, Dr. Harold Saylor says, no situation is hopeless when God steps on the scene. For hopeless is not a word that is in the vocabulary of the Almighty. It is a fact. He majors on the word hope. So I pray that we will not lose hope, that our hope is, that, is anchored for, uh, that is anchored for the soul is really anchored in heaven. So may this be a reminder that all of us need an anchor because one day, sooner or later, we will face difficulties and trials and we will only be able to hold on if our anchor is in God. Amen? Amen? And I like what uh, I, I would like to call on our our worship team. There is this song that was written by um, by a pastor named Edward Moat. He is a hymnal writer, and it talks about exactly what we are talking about here. And it says here in the verse, it says, "My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name." When darkness veils his lovely face, I'll rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy day, my anchor holds within the veil. That anchor holds within the veil. Within uh, the blood of Jesus torn that veil, that's why we can go direct straight to the to Father. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. If you put your anchor on the sinking sand, on your, probably your strength, your talent, or, or other hope, you know those are sinking sand. The only solid, solid rock is Christ alone. So let's pitch that anchor in Christ alone. His oath, his covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood when all around my soul gives way. He then is all my hope and say, when we shall when he shall come with trumpet sound oh may then may i then in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone faultless to stand before the throne on christ the solid rock i stand may you request everyone to please rise as we sing this song the solid rock Trust the sweetest spring, but oh. 
bow down our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your wonderful message to all of us, Lord God. Indeed, Lord, we know, you know, Lord God, that here in this earth, Lord God, we will face different types of problems, Lord God. Health problems, Lord God. Work problems, Lord God. Family problems, Lord God. Father, sickness, Lord God. Persecution, Lord God. Father, you know all these things will happen, Lord God. And that's why you have given that hope, Lord God. And you have commanded us, Lord God, instructed us, Lord, to put our hope in Jesus alone, Lord God, our solid rock, Lord God. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for giving us this hope in you. Father, we pray that all of us will commit, Lord God, to put this hope in you alone, Lord God, because other rock, Lord God, other, other things, Lord God, will our sinking sand, Lord God, that we, we, if we put, if we anchor our hope in the sinking sand, Lord God, when the storms come, Lord God, it will easily be, Lord, our lives will be tossed here and there, Lord God, and we will be broken, Father. Lord, thank you, Lord, for your Son, Jesus Christ, Lord God, who went ahead as a forerunner for us, Lord God, to pitch that anchor, Lord God, in the solid rock, Lord God. Father, thank you so much. I pray for my brothers and sisters here, sisters here, Lord God. If they're facing difficulties, Lord God, I pray that you meet them where they are right now, Lord God. Father, guide them, help them, Lord God. Help us to grow, Lord God, in our faith in you, that these trials, tribulations that we're facing is just a part of, for, for us, Lord, to grow in our walk with you, Lord God. Father, thank you so much. I pray blessings upon blessings, Lord God, for every family represented here, Lord God. Father, again, thank you, and we bring back to you all the glory that you so much deserve, and we pray this in Jesus Christ. Amen and amen and amen. God bless you all.
And uh, have a blessed Sunday. For those of you who have registered to True Beauty, please come here by 2 o'clock. And I know you will have a great time with Sister Venus Ra. And for all, for all of us, see you again next Sunday. God bless you all.